Okay, well, well thank you everybody for um, coming to listen to me talk about FPGAs. And um, I, actually what I want to talk about are the EPIC benefits, and EPIC is actually an abbreviation as um, I hope you'll be able to follow by the end of the talk. Let me just start by introducing um, my lab. Um, my, my lab's called the Computer Engineering Laboratory. They don't look anything like a lab. <laughs> these, 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 I'll, I'll get to that. So, um, computer, so, so my lab is called the Computer Engineering Laboratory, and we focus on trying to use parallelism to solve computationally difficult problems. And so what we try to do is develop new computing architectures, new applications of um, technology, and new design techniques using different technologies. We do focus on FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays, but we also do stuff with VLSI and parallel computing. And um, our work is in um, nanoscale interfaces, so in, in you know, c connecting electronics to nanoscale um, sensors and things like that. Machine learning. And the topic of today's talk, reconfigurable computing. And I'll explain what reconfigurable computing means in a moment. And we work with um, DST Group in Australia, um, Intel and Altera, Xilinx, um, Exablaze is an Australian company, we'll talk about that. And we're world leaders, and I'll explain how. So this is our Christmas party, and we, we're so far ahead that we have our Christmas party always in November. <laughs> <laughs> we started that. <laughs> Are you sure it's not late? <laughs> okay. So um, here's an outline of the talk. I'll talk about, um, I'll explain what a field programmable gate array is um, to start with, and what reconfigurable computing is. I'll talk about some applications of reconfigurable computing. I'll talk about some of the research work that we've done. And I'll finish by talking about other fun stuff. So that kind of implies that this is not fun stuff. But um, the, the idea, I'm told that if you put the interesting stuff at the end, then people are less likely to walk out during your talk. <laughs> okay. So FPJs. So who knows? what an FPJ is. Okay, so hopefully everybody will by the end of this talk. So it's conceptually a user customizable integrated circuits. So mostly to design an integrated circuit you have to you know use a bunch of design tools, put down up to 20 billion, 30, 40 billion transistors and then um, you basically describe a pattern and then you make a set of masks and um, you, know, you, you, you turn the crank and then out the other end comes the integrated circuit. You actually need a lot of money to do this as well. So if you're going to do one in, um, well put it this way, there aren't that many companies that can design integrated circuits at the kind of nanometer scale technologies that you, know, you would get in a desktop, um, you know, a, Intel processor or a GPU or something like that. There are only, you know, probably ten companies. You know, they're the Intels, the um, Xilinxes, Broadcom. You know, that kind of company can design these chips, but most other companies can't. How many can make them? Only about three. <laughs> well, there aren't that many um, nanometer scale fabs. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. TSMC, TSMC, there's um, Intel. Global, you know, the, the, there are just a handful of foundries that can make these really state of the art, and they're, they're billions of dollars to, um, to to make these foundries. Okay, so what do all the other people do? There aren't that many markets that can justify spending hundreds of millions to a billion dollars on an integrated circuit for a product, right? So what do, what does everybody else do? Well, they can differentiate their product from others by buying these user customizable integrated circuits and developing their IP on this platform. Okay, so what's an FPGA? Well, the, the, this is a cartoon, right? But um, mm -hmm. there are configurable logic blocks. So you can think of these as simple logic gates. So something like an AND gate or an OR gate or something like that. Um, 
The reason they're called configurable logic blocks is that they take a small number of inputs, they can perform some kind of digital function, in fact they can perform any digital function of the number of inputs, and they can produce some outputs. Okay, but, but only a small one, so typically maybe you have six inputs and two outputs, right? And then you, you, you can kind of make any type of logic you like with that. So that's the logic part. Then there are dedicated blocks. If you want to design an integrated circuit, you might need things like memories and multipliers and um, adders, things like that. There are these ones in um, purple. And so here's a short list of dedicated blocks. You can have memories. You can have transceivers, so a large part of the FPJ market is actually in communications, and you might want to you know, connect up to Ethernet and things like that, so there are blocks to help you do that. Um, there are multipliers for doing signal processing, face-up loops, um, and then all the way up to rather large blocks like ARM cores, as I'll kind of explain later. These are kind of hard blocks that you put in the FPJ. So the configurable logic blocks are small logic elements. These are you know, blocks to help you do often used functions. And then you have input and output blocks so that you can support different logic standards. And the real secret is that you have programmable routing. So what you can do is that you can interconnect this logic in any way you like. And if you can do that, then you can make anything you like because you can just connect up gates. And as long as it's digital, you can just build arbitrary circuits. And so that's what an FPJ is. It's a chip that you can buy off the shelf. You can design what you want to make with design tools. Then the design tools will create what's called a net, a, a bit stream which defines how these configurable logic blocks, what functions they um, make, and how we interconnect them. You download it to the FPJ, and in, you know, in a, a minute, you can have a, um, a, a complete digital design. Okay, everybody with me? Yep. Any questions? Yes? How's the routing done? It's, it's, it's so the, the, it's basically a, um, a a bunch of pass transistors, so, so a bunch of switches that allow you to connect inputs from one side to outputs on the other side. So, so is this just a two-dimensional crossbar? Yeah, yeah. That's all. So well, it's not what actually a two-dimensional right crossbar board? because it's too expensive to implement that. You, you, so you don't need the flexibility of a full crossbar. So it's what, a sparse I'm, crossbar. I'm curious, what comes in the left? Does that always go out the same right side? So they're unidirectional, if that's what you mean. No, so, I mean... So the signals can't top, go... Top one on the left it. there, coming in for the left, does that go out the top one on the right? No, on the routing. Oh. On the routing. Routing block. No, no, that... So, oh, you know, some wires would go in one direction. So, so this wire might only go in this direction, and this wire might go in the opposite direction. Okay. It's symmetrical. But they're unidirectional. But it's wires. not hard wired from, from one side to the other side. And well, the there are side. buffers in here as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because um, actually, this drives quite a high capacity. Okay. If you were doing um, TCPRP <coughs> communications with it, would it be a block that handled that, or would you. Would it be so you would or? use the transceivers? And there'd be a transceiver with a TCPIP stack in it, would there? So and there will be also a MAC, so, sorry, so MAC is not multiply accumulate, that's inside the DSP, MAC is the media access control. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, 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 so that's layer that's, six. Yeah. So two, you, you can actually implement the entire TCP stack inside the FPJ. Yeah. And that's a common application. Yeah. What about Bluetooth and Zigbee? Are they, they also things that you can embed? No, the way you... So you could implement parts of those, but they're not caused because they're not common things that people want. You can, of course, um, connect up to USB, and then you can go to, to those. So no one puts RF hardware, no one puts uh, radio 
Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to RF. There'll, there'll be a bit, quite a bit about radio. Um, okay. And there are clocking resources. So you know, one one hard part about designing integrated circuits is how you get a clock to all the corners of the chip while you know maintaining a very low skew so the clock signal arrives at all you know all the different parts of the chip. Um, the nice thing is if you're using an FPJ, you don't have to worry about that because the designers of the FPJ have already done all that hard work for you. So, you know, I, I think everybody understands the concept of um, integrated circuits in which you arrange transistors in a planar 2D structure, right? So you basically, it's like making a pizza, right? You put different layers down and um, you can connect them all with a different layer and then you can build up a chip which has transistors and interconnections of them. <laughs> One, <coughs> and um, also there's Moore's Law. So Moore's Law basically was an observation made many decades ago by Gordon Moore that technology could double the density, so double the number of transistors that you can put on an integrated circuit every two years. So, so the reason that we have today's computing technology is that we've been able to sustain this exponential growth for, for a very long time. And um, recently, one innovation that they've been using in integrated circuits that I'd like to draw your attention to is that they're actually using um, what's called stacked silicon interconnect technology. So rather than just doubling the number of transistors on a single chip every two years, what they can do now is that they can put several chips together on what's called an interposer, so basically a substrate, and you put several chips together and you can interconnect them and put them all in the same package. In the old days that was called the circuit board. <laughs> <laughs> Except this is like really small and it's got really high interconnection density. Well, some of the Pentiums were made with multi yeah. chip like that too. Yeah. The slide before, before was gallium arsenide. No, this is all silicon. That's sil so this is all silicon. This is all silicon, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but it's called stack silicon interconnect technology. So multiple FPJ down a silicon interposer. For some reason, even though it's like 2, 2D, they call it 2.5D, and, um, and, or sometimes 3D. And they can basically make a big FPJ out of several chips that are put together on one of these things. And so using this, they can actually grow the density faster than Moore's Law because you know, Moore's Law would only bring us a doubling in this period. Right? But if they can double the density on the integrated circuit and they can put two on, uh, um, in the same package, then you can get four times. So they've actually been able to even outpace Moore's law using this type of technology. These are stacked to planar, are they? They're not on top of each other. Yeah. And 3D is when you put them on top of each other. So it looks something like this. So you can have, you know, this is an example with four die, and there are little bumps on the bottom, and they're connected. They're called micro bumps, and um, um, basically this is a through silicon via. So this is a, this is the silicon interposer. You can go down, and um, but basically go to the package, the pins on the package. So basically this technology allows substantially larger devices um, but you can treat it as a single device and um, you know this technology is remarkable. The actual CAD technology to make it look like a single chip is also quite amazing. <laughs> um, is there a and, um, yeah, so we can buy these off the shelf. Yeah. Now here's a block diagram, so, so I showed you the simplified cartoon, here's a block <coughs> diagram of what um, you can almost buy today, so these have been announced and I think they're sampling, but I don't think you can actually you know, go out and buy one right now. Um, so we've got, um, where do I start, okay let's start with the FPJ part. This is the programmable logic, so these, these are the, um, 
you know, configurable logic blocks and programmable interconnect. Um, up here we've got an ARM Cortex A53 processor. So this is a quad core ARM processor. And we've got a second ARM processor here that you can hand off real time processing to. And um, a um, dynamic memory controller. Um, blocks to do security, blocks to do power and system management, um, system control. So, so this basically looks like a high-end microprocessor, microcontroller. And um, you have, you know, basically high-speed connectivity to the outside world through this. And, um, you know, all this is on a single chip. So Raspberry Pi and a block. Um, Raspberry Pi plus the FPGA part. So, you know, yeah. this would be a Raspberry Pi. You know, this mm. plus, you know, you know this yeah. part would be a Raspberry Pi, oh, yeah. and then you have got the stuff, stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, and there was a joke at, um, that um, an Intel person, actually, an Intel um, processor person was telling an FPJ person in that, okay, you've got this chip and it takes you, you know, six to 12 months to design and, you know, the tools take 12 hours to compile a design and you, you actually have paying customers for this type of technology. Um, so the, the weakness of FPGAs has been that it's really hard to make a design work on an FPGA. Um, it's much easier than, say, to do an inter integrated circuit, but compared to programming, um, it's maybe an order of magnitude more work. And this has been because the way you program FPGAs is normally in a hardware description language like um, VHDL or Verilog, which is very low level. So you're talking at the level of gates, and um, that's always been very difficult. There's been a slow move now to high level tools. So um, there's a, two that I'd like to highlight. One is Chisel, which was developed by Berkeley. There's a new open source processor called RISC-V and, um, and, and that's developed in Chisel. So Chisel is a, like a modern um, functional programming language for those people familiar with that. Like, kind of, and um, it's a domain specific language which is for FPGA design. So for digital design, so you can actually describe very elegantly modules that you know that, that describe large pieces of um, digital hardware. Doesn't the VHDL have modules and things as well? Though, How's it yeah, it's not very good though. Chisel's a lot more powerful in that you can describe, you know, a circuit that would take many lines of the HDL in one or two lines. Yeah. yeah. It's like C versus assembly language yeah. type of and um, recently both the two major FPJ vendors, Xilinx not and Intel, um, have come out with C based design tools. These used to be really hopeless in the past, but they're actually pretty good now and they're actually usable. Um, you know, if you don't care too much about getting the last, you know, 10% from the chip. So, um, reconfigurable computing. So that's quite easy. Reconfigurable <coughs> computing is the application of FPGA technology to computing problems. And I want to highlight the advantages of FPGAs compared to microprocessors. Um, with the abbreviation um, EPIC. So the advantages are um, by virtue of being more energy efficient. So you can reduce power consumption, which is actually important because um, the speed that we can compute nowadays is limited by power rather than anything else. Um, parallelism to make things faster interface and customization. So I'm going to go through these four points. So processors sit here and 
If you actually take processes and you turn them into application specific instruction processes or digital signal processes, you kind of specialize the instruction set so that they're really good at a certain class of applications and you can normally get an order of magnitude energy efficiency. Right? So you know if the you know that the application is not anything at all, which is what Intel processors are designed for. Right? If we know we're only going to use them for signal processing applications, then we can actually make things a bit more efficient. The more specialized we make something, the more energy efficient we can do it. So that if you go to the ultimate um, most energy efficient one, if we just design a chip to do one function, we can make that more energy efficient than we can make a general purpose processor. Right? Just because we can specialize the hardware more. So reconfigurable computing kind of sits between the um, programmable processors and the dedicated hardware. And there's approximately three orders of magnitude between these um, two extremes. And, and so most of our processing is done with the embedded processors because that gives us the best design productivity. But, you know, reconfigurable computing can take us here. Um, parallelism. So parallelism is simple. If you um, have many copies of the same thing, then you can get more done in a certain amount of time. So in a microprocessor, if you think about it, what, what happens? You have this um, program and the model is that this program is stored in memory and the processor will fetch an instruction from memory. It will interpret that and it will make some change to the state of the processor and it will do this over and over again. Right? So it's kind of sequential. You're only doing one thing at a time. And yes, you can you know, go to clusters and all that, but, but the processes themselves are pretty <coughs> sequential. Um, in an FPGA, you can actually execute independent tasks in parallel. And um, you can also do pipelining, so you can, um, you, you can kind of make a production line of your processing. So you can have you know, someone do step one, step two, step three. So I like to make the analogy with McDonald's. If you go in there and you order something, one person takes your order, then the next person will you know, get, get the, the hamburger or whatever, and the th third person will you know, pass it to you. And so the amount of time it takes to go through this process is the same, but because they have three people working on it, they can get, they can overlap these three stages, and so they can get three times more customers through this production line than if they didn't exploit this pipeline. Okay. Um, parallelism is good. The problem is that. Um, not all tasks, um, <laughs> you know, are that amenable, and so it's very hard to get perfect parallelism. Um, you know, normally, you, you, if you have n things, you, it's not n times faster. As I say, if sixty, if one block can dig a hole in sixty minutes, sixty blocks can dig the same hole in one minute. <laughs> they just yeah. can't get the shovel. <laughs> okay. Um, FPJs also provide the opportunity to integrate what might take several chips into a single package. So the amount of time to transfer data from one chip to another chip is very high compared to the amount of time you required to send it internally in the chip because we can operate at much higher frequencies inside the chip. So um, if you can combine your networking, your chip I.O. and your computation all on the same device, there's an opportunity to do things with much lower latency. And um, also to get efficient transfers, you need to buffer in, in order to send the data from one chip to another in a stream, and that increases latency. So um, in FPJ designs, if you can keep everything on a single chip, then you have massive interconnect inside the chip and um, if you can exploit that then you can have massive bandwidth. And also FPJs have lots of small memories which if you can access them all at the same time give you enormous um, on-chip bandwidth. 
So we can exploit all of these um, through integration. Finally, customization. Um, So given that it's really expensive to design an integrated circuit, but it's actually relative pretty cheap to design an FPGA, I can specialize an FPGA to an extent that I can't specialize an integrated circuit. So I'll give you an example. Um, one person designed, made a RSA processor, and what it would do is it would basically compile the key, your RSA key, into the circuit. So you wouldn't design an integrated circuit that only worked for a single key, right? Because you, you, you've got to make lots of them for it to be worthwhile. But you could make an FPGA design that only works for a single key and then change the design to a different design to support a different key. And so you can customize FPGAs to an extent that you cannot customize integrated circuits. And that's another optimization that one can make. So, I've been working on reconfigurable computing for a long time, and, um, and finally we think that it's come of age, and I'll explain why I think it's timely. So, if you do a Microsoft Bing search, and, and nobody actually uses Bing to my knowledge, but <laughs> if you were, that would actually go through FPGAs. So, Microsoft had a project called Project Catapult, and they tried to accelerate the Bing search using FPGAs. And what they found is that in the search game, you've got to reply in a certain amount of time, or the users lose interest and go somewhere else. And so they worry about the latency of the tails. So, you know, if given there's a distribution about how long it takes to respond to someone, what they care about is how long is this tail? And they found that using FPGAs, they could reduce it dramatically um, for the same cost. And, um, and so Microsoft have now, in all of their servers, and there's more than a million of them worldwide, all of their machines in their data centers have FPGA boards in them. And they're using them for accelerating machine learning, doing database queries, and all that sort of thing called Project Catapult. In 2015, Intel acquired the, um, one of the two major FPGA companies, Altera, and um, so they, they said at the time that 30% of servers will be equipped with FPGAs by 2020. Baidu, which is the Chinese version of um, Google, um, using FPGAs to accelerate database and machine learning. Amazon have um, FPGA instances that you can actually um, use. Um, Tencent, that do the um, WeChat thing, um, are using FPGAs in their cloud for image resizing. Um, Alibaba also have a um, pilot project to um, use FPGAs. And, these are just a few, IBM and all that are doing the same thing. So where do you think yes. these things sit against the, the use of GPUs for some of the same things? Okay, so um, GPUs are really good for floating point applications and for high throughput applications. FPGAs, I think, are good for the host needs to send the data to the GPU, just that. And, and going to the GPU and back is mm. quite a high latency. I'll talk about some applications here that you can do everything in less than the latency to send to GPU and back on an FPGA. And that's mainly because of integration. You can integrate it more mm. tightly. So let's talk about some applications of FPGAs. Um, so in this club, we ha um, I actually brought a red Pattaya board that some of you saw. This is about a three to four hundred dollar board, and um, it uses an architecture where you get inputs from an ADC. You um, do a um, you, you basically um, do mixing to produce I and Q um, streams, and then these are. Um, um, 
these downsample the signal to reduce the data rate. <laughs> and there's some filtering, fixed point to floating point converter into a FIFO, and then into a CPU. And the CPU is actually in the same device, it's the ARM processor on this device. And then the difference between this and, say, a superhead receiver is that um, you can actually sample the entire HF band as opposed to a, you know, a small part of it. And so with this um, whisper receiver, you, ca um, you can implement um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bands and decode them all at the same time. And I really like this architecture because you've got the FPJ doing the stupid grunt work and then, you know, this gets put to a CPU that does the kind of complicated algorithmic work. Um, we've reduced the data rate from 125 mega samples down to 375 samples per second, right? Mm -hmm. And so the processor can work on things at a rate that it's comfortable with and you can do it mostly in software. And the FPGA is used to kind of do the front-end processing. It's 14 bits of precision and up for signal noise? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, so if I remember correctly, it might be in the next thing. So we know that the ICOM 7300s are good, um, is a pretty good radio, and its receiver is, um, you know, is state of the art. And I'm not sure what the input, um, I, I think the input ADC is 14 bits, but I could be wrong. It'll either be 14 or 16. Um, the other nice thing about using this type of um, architecture is that it can take advantage of Moore's law. So when you have transistors and analog work, then that doesn't scale with Moore's law because, um, because the, tr the transistors don't really improve in terms of noise and um, dynamic range and all this as you shrink the technology. However, with digital, as you shrink the technology, it becomes more and more powerful. So the trend is to actually try to do more and more digitally and, and minimize the, the analog section. So you want to get it into digital form as soon as you can, then process on that so that you can take advantage of more law. The receiver's got the advantage of band pass built in front of the ADC there. Sorry, the, the receiver has the advantage of the band pass built in front of the ADC. Yeah. So it's not digitizing the list in the whole band. Well, you, so yeah. it depends, like, like everything, it kind of depends. You can make really nice and fully analog receivers and you can make really nice... I oh, know, I love the digital approach, yeah. but people forget the benefit of the band pass built at the front. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and the, this kind of, if, if you think at a high level, this is almost the same thing, right? So the processing chain in the 7300 is you come in, you have bandpass filter, analog digital converter, into an FPJ. The FPJ does the front end processing, it reduces the, um, the, the rate of the signal, and then it passes it to a DSP to do the do, do the work that it can do. Okay. And just to note, this is a very modest size FPGA. It, it's a kind of low-end FPGA that they have in the 7300. Um, and, um, and, and there are much more powerful FPGAs. You could make a much more powerful radio if you want. That's if, the next model. I want to do it all at once. If, if you want <laughs> to the next year, the next year's model. Okay. Oh, so uh, I'll show you. I'll show you a. Okay. Um, I'll talk more about some radios later. So, you know, some nice applications that um, um, that, that I'd like to point out. So, since about two thousand and three, probably earlier, Formula One have been using FPGAs. So, that you know, it's a really nice application because money's no object in Formula One and, and you know they want to reduce, improve performance as much as they can, they want to push technology as much as they can to get it um, advantage. So as early as 2003 
the vehicle com control module in um, the Williams car um, basically controls the gearbox, diff, traction control, launch control, and telemetry for this car. And so this is a nice high-speed real-time control and DSP application problem. So I think um, Clifford said, you know, what, what are FPJs compared to FP GPUs? I think often when we put real-time, hmm. it's a real-time application, then FPJs you know, often have advantages well, in I've the data centre. I've heard GPUs because they've been using machine learning and you have yeah. them on these slides. So. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to later talk about a specific type of machine learning in which we think FPJs are advantageous. But for training machine learning systems, then GPU is, uh, you know, the right technology. Okay. Um, so the CERN Large Hadron Collider, um, there are a number of experiments in it. Um, there's one experiment called the Compact Mule on Solenoid. And um, so my knowledge of particle physics is not very good, but my understanding is that you smash particles together and these create a lot of new par new particles there are detectors um, inside this so this is actually a really big tunnel and a person's only about that big mm. um, there are detectors all through this um, um, you know in the detector stage and they're doing these collisions at 10 to the 5 collisions per second because the probability of a Higgs event, which is what they were looking for, is very low. In fact, they were expecting about 100 Higgs events per year. So they smash these together, and then there are silicon detectors, that, not silicon, but there, there are detectors that detect the trajectory of the particles. And what they want to do is track the trajectory and see whether it might be a Higgs event. Right? So they're basically looking for a needle in a haystack. So they've got to make this many collisions per second, and they're only expecting this many per year. So what they do is that they use the FPJs, which is more than 500 FPJs, as a trigger. So the FPJs look at this trajectory, and if it looks like it might be an interesting trajectory, they'll then record it. And so this is... Um, basically a 1.5 terabit per second real-time signal processing problem. Um, and also, because um, so, so this slide comes from Jeff Hall, who was a colleague of mine at Imperial College, and you know, he said, well, we don't know, this was before they actually found it, we don't know what we're looking for, we don't even know if our algorithms are right. So they want, they want to be able to change the design of these FPGAs you know, as they learn more about the physics, because, you know, they hadn't turned it on, you know, at that point. So how many have they had Higgs boson events? I don't they... know. Well, they managed to find it, so I'm not oh, really yeah. up to date on that. So they've managed to... So I know they've had one. Yeah. <laughs> well, they only need one, so, the, you know, the, 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 the end game is a Nobel Prize. And, you know, You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then they run away and go yeah. and tell the shareholders. <laughs> so, so that's the difference between physics and engineering. In physics, you only need one event. <laughs> <laughs> In engineering, you want to make it consistent. Who gets the Nobel Peace Prize? The theoretical <laughs> physicist who thought about it, or the one who actually measured it and found it? Well, Higgs is the <laughs> theoretical physicist. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so the square kilometre array um, yeah. um, um, is one of the largest, most ambitious um, science projects. Fun fact, um, um, so, so John Bunton used this slide at a conference, and um, he said in his talk that the piece of land that they have allocated for the Australian part of the Higgs, uh, sorry, the square kilometre array is the size of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, and basically CSIRO were developing um, a square kilometre array pathfinder, so the square kilometre array itself, because of its scale, is probably going to be a custom chip, right? They have the volume and the budget to justify custom chip. But the prototypes are going to be done in FPJ, mm -hmm. and um, CSIRO working on that um, with existing telescopes. Um, here's an example in mobile backhaul. 
And um, so basically, my understanding is that that's <coughs> connecting um, mobile base stations to wi wires on the other end. So basically, uh, air to um, okay. cables interface. And so these new FPJs are designed pretty much specifically for that application. And um, they have very high speed um, front end um, DACs of ADCs and um, you know but basically this um, signal chain looks pretty similar to you know other signal chains in that you know the data comes in and then you want to reduce the data rate and then you want to squirt it out the other end. Um, the thing is that these new Xilinx Ultrascale Plus FPOs are designed for these type of um, applications and so they have the hard blocks in there like um, forward error correction and all that in the hard blocks so that they can process at the speeds that they need to do. So, okay. so I'll talk a bit now about um, some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, we worked on time domain multiplexing of single photons. So this is with physics. Um, basically, you can generate single photons with a um, physical process and um, if you do it this way you generate them in pairs and so you can think of the two photons generated as um, the red one and the blue one they're actually at different wavelengths so that's a, a good um, analogy and what we did is that we so one problem which is holding back um, quantum computing using photonics is that it's hard to generate single photons at a high rate. So you, the, the rate that they're generating it is not high enough. So what we did is that um, you can generate these synchronized to a four-phase clock. So there are four phases and the photons would appear randomly on these four phases and when we are able to generate a photon, they occur in pairs. So we can detect one of the photons, the blue one, and um, if you can detect this blue one, you know there's a red one here, and we call that heralding. But of course, um, when you detect a photon, you destroy it at the same time. But we know there's the red one there. And so what we do is that we time multiplex it so that if we do see a blue one in the second slot, we'll delay the red one so that it's going to appear always in the first slot. So we can take photons on four phases of the clock and we can make it always appear on the first phase. And um, that's actually significant and um, we, can significant, we can enhance the occurrence of photons. Um, we were able to actually double the rate that we could generate these photons. I actually had a nice um, video which I can show people interested later, but unfortunately on this machine I'm not able to show it. Most of our research is on machine learning using FPJs. And um, we believe that FPJs present an opportunity to do real-time machine learning at a rate that you couldn't do it before. Um, the infrastructure is available, but there aren't any hardware-friendly algorithms. So let me talk about some of the motivation. So latency is crucial to um, making money in trading systems. And um, low latency trading looks to trade in transient situations where the market e equilibrium is disturbed. So um, there's the, this kind of fair price thing that in equilibrium, everything that you see on the market is a fair price because, you know, if it wasn't, then someone would be able to figure out a way to um, always win. And, um, but in transient situations, you disturb this equilibrium. And um, it's been said um, by um, you know, Information Week that basically if you can reduce latency by one millisecond, that translates to about $100 million per year for a large trading firm. So how does it work? Well, in a low latency exchange, you have a data source, then you have a bunch of traders. These are actually just computers. So the market data is a computer in a rack, a server in a rack, 
these traders are actually service in Iraq. <laughs> And um, the exchange is actually another server in the rack. And they're all connected with cables. All the cables are the same length so that nobody gets an advantage in, in the... Uh, in the velocity effect. Yeah, in the <coughs> flight along the cable. <laughs> and um, the idea is that given when you get new data, you want to actually process it, figure out what the fair price of everything is. And if there looks to be an advantageous trading situation, You've got to be the first person to make the trade, or if somebody else makes it, you've lost the opportunity. It would be nice to have... Um, well, we're working with a company, and surprisingly, the two world leaders in making low latency products for um, this type of trading are Australian. So we're working with one of the two, they're, they're both based in Sydney, called Who, Exablaze. Who's the other one? Um, Meta... Meta, 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 Meta yeah. Meta, Meta, Meta. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Exablaze have this box called Exalink Fusion. It has 48 SFP plus ports. It's a layer two switch. It can actually... So one problem we have in these trading um, situations is that you have market data come in and you want to say replicate it so that you can have several traders look at this data. You don't want to incur latency doing this. These guys can um, replicate data in 5 nanoseconds. So you can go from one input port to 48 in 5 nanoseconds. And um, the switch itself is 110 nanoseconds. So, you know, these are several times faster than the fastest, say, Cisco type switches. They also have a network interface control card that has, is optimized for latency. And, um, you know, th this has latency um, of about 780 nanoseconds. So we have uh, equipment to do really low latency programming, uh, you know, transactions. What we can't do is machine learning with this type of latency with current technology. There's also throughput. So we're able to acquire images at rates that we can't actually store them or we can't um, process them. And so with things like hyperspectral satellite images, big data, etc., we've been talking to Circa, they archive financial data. They have three petabytes of historical data, but no one can really use all three petabytes. How do you transfer it? So We've also had really big improvements in machine learning algorithms. Um, however, there's kind of a mismatch between the, the rate that we can generate data and the rate that we can process it. So we argue that we can't do machine learning at the data rates that are necessary to be able to keep up with these data sources. So we've been looking at um, using FPJs to um, process data in the following manner. You have data coming in, and then you try to have a model which makes a prediction based on the data. Then you can compare the prediction with what you observe later on as what really happened. And then you take this error and you change the model in a way that it will converge to a solution that improves the approximation over time. So these are called online algorithms. The way we normally do machine learning um, is that we store the data in memory and then we make multiple passes over the data to figure out our model. Right? In this, the, the, the main difference is that in this approach, when we get data, we only touch it once, right? And we update it and then we throw it away. So we don't have to store the data. Um, we've been working with a technique called kernel methods. So um, linear methods can only provide linear solutions. So a linear solution, basically I can draw a line through this um, plane, right? And if I was able to find a line which would separate the blue and the red dots, then I'd be able to find a linear solution and I'll be able to solve the problem. And, and basically Gauss figured all this out many um, centuries ago. And we've got really good techniques for doing that. 
Um, what kernel methods do is that it can take these um, nonlinear problems and it can map it to a high dimensional space where it's easy to find a linear solution. So we can use all our tricks from linear algebra that we've accumulated over the years. And also computers are optimized for linear algebra. We can solve the problem in this space. And doing this is very inexpensive. So I won't go into the details about this. But it's a um, very nice technique. And we can implement it well in hardware. So we've made a whole bunch of um, implementations of kernel methods, starting from a flexible FPGA-based implementation, which has a five times improvement over a, um, a Xeon class um, processor. And then we developed high throughput implementations. Um, this can actually process data at 70 gigabits per second. So you can continuously put 70 gigabits per second of data into it, which is about as fast as we can send data to a chip. And um, it can keep up with that, and it's a 300 times speed up over um, a processor. We've got low latency implementations of these kernel methods, um, which can do the processing with a latency of um, this braided implementation is 13 cycles at 100. So it's about, I can't remember the number now. It's, it's less than 200 nanoseconds we can respond to an event. And so that's really low latency. And um, we can also, so the problem sizes that we can deal with with these in two implementations are quite small. This has really large capacity. It's got about a thousand times higher capacity than these implementations, um, but it's not quite as fast. So we've made a whole bunch of kernel method implementations that allow you to you know, be in different places on this latency versus throughput graph. Um, so we've also been working in doing machine learning on radio frequency signals. So we're using these radios from ETIS. Um, they don't look as cool as uh, 7300. It's just a beige box with you know, two antenna inputs. And, um, but actually, the technology is pretty amazing. Um, so it basically does from DC to 6 gigahertz. The front end is all gallium arsenide. The FPGA inside is about 10 times bigger than the FPGA in the 7300. And um, you know, that allows you to implement your um, RF front end, as well as your processing, as well as making your response, all in the same machine. And it's actually compatible with GNU Radio, so you can use you know, all the modules from GNU Radio. Um, what we've implemented is an anomaly detector. So you take radio signals in, you um, take it to a baseband, and then you, you put the inputs as the inputs to a neural network, and you train the neural network to make the output the same as the input. So how would that be useful? Well, after you train it, if you put an input that's a little bit different to one of the inputs you've seen before, the output will become what the output you know, that you've seen the most of, that's the most similar to. Okay? If you put an input that doesn't look anything like what you've seen before, then the output will be very different to the input. And we can say that's an anomaly, because it didn't look like any input I've seen before. And then we can use that. Um, the application for this could be jamming, so to detect when you're being jammed, or counter jamming. So, so but basically, you know, the jamming signal might appear as an anomaly. So drone killing. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we implemented this on this Edis platform, and we can process every sample of a 200 megahertz waveform using these um, machine learning techniques. And then the architecture looks like this. There's a radio core which comes up with IQ samples. 
it gets passed to our neural network, which you know can change it to frequency domain or can process in the time domain. It does this autoencoder, and then it can take some action. And this doesn't require the host machine to be involved, but also you can send the data at the same time to the host machine, which will train the neural network in software and upload the new weights to this machine learning hardware. So here's an example, you know, this is the signal and, you know, when it crosses this red threshold then we call it an anomaly, so these are the anomalies here. And, um, you know, it all fits nicely on the FPGA that we're using. Okay. So, my hour's up. I had a bunch of other things that are not really related to this. Um, Keep going. Keep going. Okay, great. So, um, one thing is that University of Sydney actually um, has the largest radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. So, this is the... Um, so, when do we visit? Well, that's the thing. Um, we could organise a trip there. Yeah. Moonbeams. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so, the, yeah, um, the guy that um, looks after the place, he has a pet tiger snake. And, you know, it's a very fun place. Um, but this is a cross. It's a, called the Mills, uh, Mills Cross. And, it's been around a while, that one. Yeah. yeah it's been around. Well, the nice thing is you can go and you can play. And as I was telling Greg, it's all homebrew. So these amplifiers and all that, you know, all the equipment, it's all, all homebrew stuff. So we can pull it apart? Yeah, that won't mind. There's actually a, a <laughs> test array. There's a small array and you can, you know, you can walk around with it. Um, we've been... Also working on tracking mass boobies. So um, nobody's actually record. So there are recorders that can video and do, do simultaneous video and GPS tracking of animals. However, their battery life is only about two hours. Um, mass boobies, um, basically the um, female will sit on its eggs in, so this is in Lodhau Island, the female sits on the eggs, and the male actually goes foraging for food, and they can fly for 24 hours. And, um, and nobody had actually recorded um, the diving of these mass boobies, so they actually dive into the water and pick up fish for the wife, so, so the, the male will dive, it will catch the fish, and then it will... Um, I think it swallows it, it flies back to the nest and then regurgitates it for the wife and babies to eat. So my colleague actually studies these, he's a nutritional ecologist and um, he wanted to basically record the flight path of the boobies and he also wanted to record the diving event which nobody had recorded before. And um, his job is that he has to catch the birds um, and then put, so this is our video camera device, so it's not too sophisticated, it's just one of these USB video things with a really big battery attached, but in doing so we could record for 20 hours of, um, we could record 20 hours of continuous video. So you're putting so backpacks on boobies. Yeah, so, so basically <laughs> this is glued to the, to the to the bird, and um, the, then I think you rub its thing like this, and it will, it will regurgitate the, the, the fish out. He takes the fish, puts them in plastic bags, and you know does the sampling. Does he give them to the wife? No, no. Well, <laughs> what? He, <There's> hungry, <laughs> well, actually, he's not allowed to put the fish in the home. Um, <laughs> you know, strict orders from the wife. But the whole purpose of this is to understand um, animal nutrition in in the wild. So we've done these experiments in lab settings. I want to do it in wild setting. And so we managed to record the flight path of one of these. The success rate is not very high. So I think we we used about twenty of these cameras, and we got two back. Um, but we were lucky, so, so um, we, we, we managed to get all the GPS data from it. 
Um, which is quite amazing. It's a, it's a long trip, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, and unfortunately I can't show you the punchline because we actually managed to record with our video the, the, the booby diving into the water and, and um, you know, and um, we can't see the fish, but I can show other people the... Uh, so no IPRS tracker for boobies? Well, so <laughs> this was before I became a ham, and so we used just, we, we um, basically just recorded it on an SD card. Um, however, I don't think that you, so our camera could record 20 hours, I think this was about 18 hours, right. and if we had a transmitter, it would be nice, right, because you could track it while it's going, yeah, but it would add a lot to the... Power. So you have to stay near it to receive it. So we actually had it in a really light plastic box, but that added, I think we had a budget of 10, 18 grams or something, and that made it 20 grams or something. And so we had to get rid of the plastic box, and we ended up using a condom, which is actually a lot lighter <laughs> than a plastic yeah, box right. and very waterproof. So that was, uh, that was what innovation. was the problem? Did the cameras sort of fall off when they did the dive or something when you lost them? Well, we, we lost know? 18 of our 20 cameras. So. <laughs> did you lose any birds? Well, we don't know. They didn't I come back. <laughs> Okay. Um, we also do some cool work with transistors. So we, we've, we've, um, we're the first to study matching of transistors at 4 Kelvin. And the reason is that, so a lot is known about how transistors work down to about 10 Kelvin, because they need that for the space program. But if you're into quantum computing, then mm. the quantum devices work at millikelvin and the next stage of the fridge is about four kelvin so you want to put the electronics close to the quantum devices and so that motivates that you know studying the performance of transistors at okay. the four kelvin range so we made a bunch of test chips and, and test circuits to look at this and we developed um, a wide range models. So this model works from 300 Kelvin down to um, about 6 Kelvin. And if you use a conventional model, then it's pretty good, you know, down to about, so, so this is like 30 degrees and this is like, um, yeah, minus 20. So the commercial range is in here, right? This is where people are mostly interested in. And we, we, we made models that work really well all the way down to um, 6 Kelvin in terms of threshold voltage, short channel effect, etc. I'd be happy to talk in great detail about this for a bunch of different size transistors. Next month. Okay. And um, yeah, so to summarize, FPGA is a different technology to our standard store program computer technology. Um, there are a number of advantages, um, and um, you know you can, you know you can remember what they are in terms of this um, epic um, abbreviation. We've been working on intelligent proce processing of radio frequency signals, which remains a challenge, um, and basically FPGA is a key enabling technology. Particularly, there's no real other technology if you want to get the real lowest latency for this type of application. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're, we're going to continue studying this for many years, I'm sure, to come. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Anybody got any questions? Any further questions? Can we see the bird crashing in the water? Yeah, you want to see the <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Yes, Chuck. Can you talk more about the red papaya, please? The red papaya. Papaya. So it's it's basically it was designed as right. a scientific instrument. It was designed as a kind of um, lab instrument where you, you could do an oscilloscope 
spectrum analyzer function generator all in the same device so you just download different designs for the spectrum analyzer or the signal generator or whatever so to do that they want to be able to take analog inputs and generate analog outputs and basically have an FPGA attached to it where they can implement whatever it is that you want. So it's something like Raspberry Pi or no. Arduino? So it's kind of like a Raspberry Pi in that, you know, Raspberry Pi, I think, has analog in, you know, ADC and DAC um, peripherals and a processor. The, the main difference is that you've got the FPGA as well, which will allow you to process signals um, at much higher rates so that you can, I, I think it can work, I can't remember if it's 50 or 100 mm -hmm. megahertz bandwidth, mm -hmm. which you, you, you couldn't do with a relatively It's 200 megahertz per second, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But and the, times, the two channels out, two channels in, yeah. so it's, it's four channels at the yeah. same time. Yeah. But actually, yeah, the, the, the nice thing is the FPGA allows you to implement anything that, you know, you can do with ADCs coming in and DACs going out. So you can actually, there's a transceiver design as well. Um, and, yeah. you know, it, it's a, in the three to four hundred dollar range. It's not a great ham radio because it doesn't have the right filtering at the front end. Right. But, you know, in, in terms of the flexibility, it's actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Sorry? So, no. Something you said about the FPGAs up front, about the interconnection switches, mm -hmm. and how that they weren't, there was, I forget the word term you used, but it was, not, to me, me it meant that you had uh, less than the optimum number of um, cross joins that you could um, set up, pathways that you could set up. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever run short of those when you... So, the, in the early FPGAs, yes, you could run out of routing resources, but in modern FPGAs, um, that's, they've got plenty of routing resources. So you don't run out of it at all? Not in practice. No. They've also got very smart floor plans that decide where to put different parts of your design yeah. on the chip so that it minimizes the routing requirement. Yeah. Yeah, mm. but, but, you know, a large design will, so, so these designs that I'm talking about, they take about eight hours to, um, to place and route. Um, so, <laughs> so, so that's what you call a go-home event. So you, you start it and then you, know, you come back and next day. You wouldn't want to go oh, and stop Probably halfway through, through due to something. Some yeah, yeah. you have to monitor it as well. <laughs> Maybe the driverless car can do with a few more FPGAs. Yeah. Elon's able to use So, yeah, that's that's the main thing. Yeah. 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 We are recording this. So this is <laughs> so this is an illustration of what we're doing with the single photon. So these photons are generated at random times, and basically we delay them by the appropriate amount so that they would appear on the first clock and on the first phase of a four-phase clock. So it's very stable output um, periodically. So. Well, actually, this isn't quite what happens because you don't get them every single. No, you don't want to be easy. He's a bit uncertain of that. It's an exaggeration. Some of us got some highs and lows in it. And the diving is this one. You don't watch too closely, it's all right. Well, actually, it's funny because um, the colleague also. Um, needs to calculate how much energy the bird has expended in this flight. So he actually goes and counts the number of wing flaps. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, no. oh, is, is the food it's bringing back more energy? Does it produce as much energy? Yeah, as what the exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the... Did this is, going, this is underwater and then... Oh, wow. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. Pretty cool, actually. They were very pleased to get this. Yeah. So it's all waterproof inside of Condom. Yep. <laughs> it's waterproof and pop. So it's working like it should. Well, it was electronically <laughs> tested, wasn't it? Yeah, we <laughs> All right. Well, very light. <laughs> very light. <laughs> well, thank you, Philip. That was yeah. excellent. Yeah, I now know a lot more yeah. about FPGA than I knew when I first walked in. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.